So we're very happy to present um, the closing keynote of the conference. Thank you again to everyone for coming um, in person and online. It's been an incredible few days. Um, and we're very honored to have Pacenta Matar here. Um, she's an author, a journalist, and a producer. Um, and uh, I got to know of her work because she's the author of the National Magazine Award-winning Walrus article, Objectivities of Privilege Afforded to White Journalists. Hello, thank you so much for having me, Ali Viv. This conference has been amazing, and I'm so honored to be closing it out. Um, and uh, this is a full circle moment for me in many ways. Um, I'm looking, for those of us in the room, I'm looking at my editor of the Walrus piece, Samia Madwar, who I'm meeting for the first time today. Nicole Schmidt is in the room somewhere, or was in the room. Oh, there you are. Um, <laughs> And for those of us joining, for those of you joining online, uh, thank you so much for listening in. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is how fact checking uh, helped me tell the story that I wanted to about objectivity, racism and power in Canadian media. And I thought I would start by um, talking about why I became a journalist. So uh, very briefly, I was born in Egypt, specifically in Alexandria. This picture right here, if you look closely, you can see me and my mom in the rear view mirror there on, on a recent trip to Alexandria. This quote that I have up is one that um, hung above my 10th grade English teacher's class, uh, her desk, her name was Miss Valencia, went to high school in Dubai. I moved around a lot and I saw this quote above her desk and I identified with it immediately. I'm at home everywhere and nowhere, never a stranger and I never quite belong. And it's that sentiment that really fueled my interest in journalism. So growing up between Egypt, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Toronto, learned Arabic at home, learned French in public school in Toronto, French immersion, shout out French immersion, <laughs> and, uh, and English everywhere. And so uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. I didn't have like a calling to become a journalist. It wasn't that I always wanted to do that. It was that I panicked at the end of my undergraduate degree, had no life plan and thought, okay, what do you like doing? I like writing. I have a few languages. I have lived in between worlds for all of my life, always asking questions about why things happen the way they do. I was always asked those questions as well as someone from many places. And so I was like, I got it. I'm going to apply to J school. And so I applied to one school and one school only. The audacity of that will never escape me. I applied to TMU and um, thought I was going to get in like real easy. And they were like, congratulations, you've been waitlisted. And I was like, oh, no, 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 you have to let me in. Thankfully, they did let me in. Um, and so I started there in 2008. And in 2009, I became an intern at the CBC. And that would start uh, what became a 10 year career in journalism. Uh, eight of those 10 years was spent at The Current um, on CBC Radio 1. I started there in 2011. Um, I began in TV actually in 2009 and I always joke around about having been rescued into radio. Uh, first I was rescued by the team at As It Happens. I was there for two weeks in the, actually no, yeah, it started as two weeks in the thick of the Egyptian revolution, stayed for six months and then uh, I applied for a staff job at The Current in 2011 and I, that's when I joined them. And um, overwhelmingly, it was, I loved my time at The Current. I loved the breadth of stories that we could tell. I loved um, coming up with intelligent ways of telling stories over a half hour in radio. We had documentaries, talk tapes, interviews, panels, debates. I loved it. This was the team at one point in time. I got to meet some cool people. When Ai Weiwei asks you for a selfie, you indulge him. <laughs> Um, I got to travel. Uh, this was Anna Maria Tremonti and I accepting a Gracie Award for an interview that we did around the Me Too, uh, uh, Me Too movement. Um, and that's so us in New York on the left and on the right in red. That was her very last show uh, when she signed off at The Current after 14 years, 17 years. Oh no. Um, we need a fact check. <laughs> We did some really impactful work. I'm very proud of the work that we did as a team at The Current. We did um, public forums across the country on the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. This was the Toronto one, which was looking at that issue through the eyes of children and youth. 
Um, those are, that's obviously myself, Anna Maria Tremonti, uh, then executive producer Kathleen Goldhar, and my, uh, my friend and producer Josh Block. Um, we traveled across the country to do a town hall on racism. We called it Facing Race. Um, once upon a time, I was sitting where our tech people are, uh, making sure the show went, went to time and, and everything worked out. So this was uh, myself, Anna Marie, and, and Yamri Tadessa in Halifax. We went to Halifax, Montreal, and Vancouver to talk about racism as it applies to environmental racism, uh, racism in healthcare, and racism in employment. Um, so it's hard to quantify the kind of work that I did at The Current uh, over eight years. It's a daily news show. So picture me and math do not get along, which is why I became a journalist. But eight years, a story a day, we're talking thousands of stories. But what you see here is just one small selection of the kinds of stories that I gravitated towards. Um, a lot on the Arab Spring. My Arabic came in handy. Shout out my dad. I think he's watching right now. He used to trap me in the basement uh, in North York on Sundays in Toronto and make us learn Arabic. I hated it at the time, but it's been very instrumental in my career. Um, and in bridging those worlds, that everywhere and nowhere um, sense of belonging. Um, something that I tried a lot to do while I was at CBC was to try to, <laughs> things have, have changed a lot, or have, let's just say, changed. Um, but there was a time where it was very hard to do stories on race as it pertains to Canada. It was always like, oh, that's an American story. We don't really have that here. And so I kind of had this uh, strategy of finding stories that were happening in the US and finding a Canadian hook. So that middle one there, police shootings of unarmed black men are a Canadian problem too. Um, I did a lot on indigenous issues, specifically indigenous women and girls. This was a story about forced sterilization. Um, and I tried to have some fun too. I love pop culture. You know, I loved getting into the diaspora wars that Drake created with his album More Life, taking from Dance Hall, uh, South African House, um, and beyond. We spoke to Somalia's first candidate, um, first female uh, presidential candidate um, from Nairobi. Anyway, um, but there was a, 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 a dynamic that was playing out. Um, and this isn't unique to me, but this was the way I wrote it in my Walrus article. Um, and it was this. So to be a journalist in any media organization or newsroom is to navigate the crush of the daily news cycle, the relentlessness of deadlines, the pressure, care, and complexity it takes to craft a story well. To be a racialized journalist is to navigate that role while also walking a tightrope. Being a professional journalist and also bringing forward the stories that are perhaps not on the radar of the average newsroom, but are close to home for many of us, and it takes a toll. So this was a dynamic that was uh, very familiar to me, and I would like to shout out all my group chats, all my journalism group chats, and my journalist friends for being a safe place to be able to talk about this tightrope that we were all on. Um, and I really credit them for the longevity that I've had in the industry, because I think I would have burnt out without them. Um, and one of, when the article that I wrote for the Walrus came out, this was one of the most often quoted pieces, and it was about being the only one in the room. Um, and so what I meant by that is when you're the only racialized person in a room, and specifically when you're pitching stories on race and racism, this was the dynamic that felt very familiar to me and to many others, and I think this is why it was shared so much. Everyone who's been the only one in the room knows what it's like. The silence that falls when a story about racism is pitched, the awkward seat shifting, the averted stares. We felt it and internalized it and expected it. We know that there is often an unspoken higher burden of proof for these stories than for others, a problem that has long been exacerbated by the fact that race-based data is rarely collected in policing, healthcare, and other fields. Yet it is on us to fill this void and prove the existence of racism. As a result, we over-prepare those pitches, we anticipate your questions, we get used to having the lives of our friends and families and the people who look like them discounted, play devil's advocate to, and intellectualized from a sanitized distance. And so when this dynamic uh, played out, um, it's not unique to where I worked. It's, I think it's something that's very um, common to many people. But the question that I always used to ask, so I used to spend a lot of time on my pitches for The Current, especially at the beginning when I was new. Um, 
sometimes I'd spend up to an hour just preparing for a pitch because it had to have a whole rollout, who's going to say what, what's the focus, what sound are we going to use. So I would spend a lot of time and sometimes these pitches would get passed on. And I would always ask why. If I've just spent half an hour or maybe in a pitch meeting five to seven minutes making the case for why we should do this story, I would like you to delineate why we shouldn't. And sometimes it was very helpful. Then I got very um, specific feedback. Oh, this voice is missing. We need this angle. And I would come back and pitch it the next day. Sometimes I'd get a green light. But then sometimes I'd get these very vague, um, these very vague reasons, like we're missing an audience connection piece. And I would be like, what do you mean by that? And so I asked why all the time. And I think as journalists, why is one of the most powerful questions, both in the work that we do and in the places that we do them. So why I was a thorn in the side of a lot of my editors, because I always wanted to know why. So um, in 2016, uh, five years into my time at The Current, and by this point, uh, seven years into my time at CBC, CBC launched uh, its inaugural Developing Emerging Leaders program. Sixteen of us were chosen from across the country. And this was an attempt to rectify the lack of racialized people in upper echelons, in management, boards of directors, editorial leadership. Um, and so I was one of the 16. I remember applying very skeptically, but something that helped sway me was that um, the program was meant to, I don't want to say fast tracked, but to highlight if either, if any one of these uh, graduates, if any one of us was applying for another job, a senior role, HR had to really take a close look at us and consider us very, um, very seriously. And so I thought, let's try this. Um, and there are some brilliant people in that picture that, you know, and I, I've said this before, this idea of us uh, maybe not me, but some of the others being emerging leaders when they'd been at the corporation for decades really didn't sit well with me. But I went with it. I wanted to believe in a kind of hopefulness that things were going to change. Um, this was in 2016. And I slowly started to, uh, during my time at The Current, I started as an associate producer, moved up to producer. And then soon I was starting to fill in a senior producer a lot. Um, to fill in for Christmas, you know, when people were away. But I was starting to take on the senior role. In 2018, uh, I got a very cool opportunity to go to Germany uh, for the Arthur F. Burns Fellowship. Um, Americans and Canadians went to Germany to report, and the Germans came to Canada and the US. Um, and this was an amazing transformative time. I got to report um, in a new country. Um, I was not desk bound like I mostly was at CBC. And I really got to tap into the things that I love doing, um, the stories that I love telling, and finding ways to tell it in a new context. I got to use my French immersion French, talking to the man on the left. Um, he was the Cameroon's youngest ever presidential candidate who had come to Berlin to court the diaspora vote. Uh, I did stories on the fight against anti-black racism in Berlin, and specifically the fight to rename racist street names. Um, and I also got to report for the first time, and for one time only, in Arabic on TV. And all I'm going to say is, thank God for editors. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was really uh, an amazing opportunity. And the reason I tell you about Germany is because while I was in Germany, a formal position for senior producer came up at CBC at my show. It's now 2018, so I've been at the show for seven years. I have filled in a senior, and I applied. And I interviewed remotely for it. Um, I never feel good after an interview, so I can't say that it went particularly well. It didn't go badly, but I thought, OK, I have a shot. I've been doing this work. I've got, you know, I've done the Developing Emerging Leaders program. I've reported in Arabic in, in Germany. This was the head of the Syrian White Helmets um, who had come for a meeting with Chancellor Angela Merkel, then Chancellor. And um, my first day back from Germany, I was actually asked to come back and immediately fill in a senior. That was going to be the job. And so I come in, I put my bag down at the senior desk, and I get called into a meeting. And the very first thing that they told me was, um, we know you applied for this job, but you didn't get it, because you need more training. And I just was gutted. I was like, I don't know what else I am supposed to do here. I've been at the show for seven years. I'm already doing this job today. In fact, I'm doing this job. I applied for it. Um, I did the Developing Emerging Leaders program. And so um, basically, uh, 
I was heartbroken, but I continued to do the work. Um, and then another opportunity to, to fill in a senior in a much more substantive way came up. A colleague of mine went on mat leave, and I filled in for her mat leave for nine months. So every day for nine months, I was one of the senior producers of The Current, which is no small task. Did that for nine months. Um, at the end of those nine months, I was called into a meeting with a manager who said, I just wanted to tell you how wonderfully you've done. Your peers, your colleagues, your host, um, fellow show leaders have all noticed that you've done a really fantastic job. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I thought, um, this is the perfect time to ask for more of those leadership opportunities. And so I said that. I said, thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that. I'd love more leadership opportunities. I want to do more of this. And I'd love for all this glowing feedback to be reflected in how I'm compensated. <laughs> and um, her face when I said these things, um, specifically about wanting more leadership opportunities. If I could pinpoint a moment when I knew that I was going to leave CBC, it was in that meeting. Because her face just turned and she looked very confused. Um, she was taken aback that I was asking for more, or it seemed to me that way. Um, and I was very confused because I'd just gotten all this glowing feedback. Um, anyway, she told me the response was I was going to have to bide my time. So a month later, it's now 2019, um, another opportunity came up and I took it, so I left. Um, I didn't say why I was leaving, and it wasn't so much that I was leaving for this new opportunity, it was that I wanted to get out of a place that I think had shown me time and time again that I was not really going to move past a certain point, always fill in, always back up. Um, and so I didn't really find the words to be able to talk about all of this until the summer of 2020, May of 2020 specifically, as we all remember, this was the month that George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis. And if you all remember that time, it was a very, uh, it was a very upsetting, overwhelming and raging time. There were reckonings underway in almost every industry, including, including ours. And I finally f tapped into the rage, the frustration, um, and all these things that I'd never really talked about and never really had time to think about because the work was just so busy with these, the crush of daily deadlines. Um, and so I put it into this piece. And I want to talk a little bit about how this piece came, the genesis of how it came to be. Um, I didn't know that I was going to write this piece, but on May 27, 2020, myself and a friend and colleague of mine, Nam Kiwanuka, were invited to do a talk on racism in media. This was in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And so I was looking forward to it, but I was nervous. This was, we were gonna talk about our industry, racism in media, and I wasn't sure how honest I was going to be. I wasn't sure what I was gonna say. So I asked Nam if she would get on a call with me just to talk through, like, what are we gonna say? How honest are we gonna be? And it was really me asking those questions because the industry is very small. I think half of us are in this room right now. Um, the other half are watching online. Um, but it was, a, it was a scary proposition to talk about what, what it was like in the industry. And uh, I remember feeling like I played it very safe. I didn't say any of, any of what I wanted to say. I felt very frustrated about my lack of honesty. Um, and that day, as soon as this panel ended, actually, there was a story that was breaking, a story of Regis korczynski Paquette, 29-year-old Afro-Indigenous woman who had fallen from her 24th floor balcony. Her family had called the police. She was having a mental health crisis. Uh, and the police were the only ones in the unit when she fell. And when I saw the news coverage of Regis korczynski Paquette's death, I saw, I know this is a theme that's come up a lot in this conference, uh, all the stories were exclusively told through repurposed police press releases, SIU, nothing from family, nothing from friends, which is ironic because her family were the ones who put the story on the radar through social media. They're, they were saying the police had killed her, and I can understand the hesitance of, of airing that statement, but the complete absence of any other source apart from the police did not sit well with me, and it just reminded me of so many things that I had seen during my time. Um, and so I remember getting a note from the Walrus's executive director, Jennifer Hollett. She had watched my session with Nam. She'd sent me this really nice, encouraging note. She said, I learned so much from you. 
um, you know, you did a great job. And I wrote back to her what was very rambly, chaotic, angry email, basically saying, I'm so ashamed of how little I said, actually. There's so much more I want to say, and I want to write it for the walrus. And I thought I had this, like, airtight pitch, and she was like, cool, well, you'll have to <laughs> officially pitch it. Here are submission guidelines. Why don't you take a shot at it? So I put together a pitch, and I sent it off. And soon I got a response from Samia Madwar, <laughs> who's sitting in the room. This is nice, so nice to see you in real life. Mm -hmm. And she wrote me this email, which was essentially green lighting the pitch, but saying, I also want to run through our fact checking process and how that might affect the reporting of the piece. And this was the first kind of sign that, oh my goodness, I was so angry when I wrote this pitch that I literally was like, I'm just going to do a 500 tweet long tweet thread um, and not write an article because it was just like spilling out of me. But I'm so glad I did not do a 500 tweet long tweet thread and instead took this to the walrus because then I got the beginning of an airtight process, a fact checked, independent um, news organization and institution that would help me tell this story in an airtight way. Um, so we got on a call, Samia walked me through what fact checking would mean, it terrified me, but it also invigorated me because I had the receipts to tell this story and it was, it could withstand a fact check. So the first place, the backbone of the piece and the first place that I thought of starting this um, article was in Baltimore. I had gone there in 2015 to report on um, the protests against police brutality that had taken off after the death of Freddie Gray. Um, he was a young black man who had been chased, arrested by police, thrown in the back of a police van and taken for what was known colloquially as a rough ride, not strapped in, driven very uh, erratically, and he was tumbling around in the back. Uh, his spinal cord was severed. He fell into a coma and died. Um, it was April of 2015 that he died, and the city erupted in anger. It was literally on fire. Um, by the time I got there, I got there in early May, and the day that I landed in Baltimore was a day that um, State Attorney Marilyn Mosby had announced charges against six police officers who were involved in his arrest. And so I remember landing in Baltimore. I was only there for 36 hours, um, but I landed. The very first place I went was Freddie Gray's own neighborhood on the day that these charges were laid. And so this is what Baltimore looked like the day I landed. <laughs> So you see it's a very jubilant atmosphere. Um, the, the charges, these, this was not a conviction, these were just charges against the six police officers involved in Freddie Gray's arrest. Such a rare sign of accountability that the, 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 the neighborhood was celebrating that, oh, maybe we might see justice in, in his death. Um, none of the six would go on to become, uh, to be convicted. Um, I had gone to Baltimore to tell uh, the story of Tyrone West, who was another black man that was killed after an encounter with police. I went to interview Tawanda Jones in the black t-shirt on the right and his mom slash aunt Diane Butler. He had been pulled over in 2013. He was driving Tawanda's Benz. Police pulled him over, accused him of having drugs. He started running. They chased him down and began to beat him, and he ended up dying as they were beating him. The official cause of death was listed as cardiac arrhythmia, heart irregularity, and a struggle in high heat. And Tawanda Jones and her mom slash aunt Diane Butler just did not buy it. And since 2013, they have been protesting every single Wednesday. They call them West Wednesdays to try to get justice for her brother's death. And her basic point is that um, these same police officers have gone on to become involved in other cases where black men have been uh, killed or um, otherwise uh, experienced violence. And she was saying if we had acted sooner, if these police officers were taken off the street, maybe other people wouldn't have suffered. So she's still protesting, even online, um, even during the pandemic, she was holding West Wednesdays online. But the, the, the thing that stood out to me the most in Baltimore was a chance interaction I had with two men um, in Freddie Gray's neighborhood, that same jubilant atmosphere that I had shown you earlier. 
I basically stayed there all day, interviewing people, talking to them, asking what their experiences were. And uh, there was a curfew in effect when I was in Baltimore. So at 10 p.m., everyone had to be off the streets. And I was looking at the time. It was very close to 10, and I was about to turn in. I was hearing helicopters starting to circle overhead, and the energy in the area was just changing. It didn't feel that same kind of jubilance and excitement. But um, I was just about to go into the subway when I was stopped by this man in the black t-shirt, Lonnie Moore. And he stopped and asked me, what news organization are you with? So I immediately take the opportunity, turn on my Marantz, and um, I begin talking to him. And I asked him one question. Um, I asked him, how many Freddie Grays are there in this neighborhood? And what's the relationship like with, with you and police? So he begins talking. And almost out of thin air, this other man appears, uh, Jared Jones in the red. And he joins the conversation so seamlessly um, and they begin, it, I literally was almost like not there. They were just almost in conversation with each other, echoing each other's statements, finish each, finishing each other's sentences, and they'd never met before. And so um, I stood there on that corner with them for about 45 minutes. Um, and I want to tell you a few things. I'm going to play about three minutes of this tape. Um, there's a few things that I want to tell you about to contextualize it. One, this will become relevant later, when Jared Jones in the red appeared, I stopped and asked him his name. And I'm, I had a, I will never forget this, I had a J school professor in my first year, Bob Ortega, in my city reporting class. And he failed me on my very first assignment because I had gotten the name of a subject wrong. And he said to me, if I can't trust you to get the name of a subject wrong, then I can't trust that anything else you say is accurate. So here's me having barely made it into J school, waitlisted, failing my first assignment, and I was scarred. But what it did is it made me so um, insistent on getting people's names right. So the first thing I did mid-conversation when Jared Jones shows up is I pull out my notebook and I say, Jared Jones, J-A-R-E-D, and he says, no, it's J-A-R-R-O-D. This will become relevant later. So you're going to hear part of our conversation. And by our conversation, I really mean their conversation. You won't hear me at all. A um, few things that I want to set up for you so you understand some of the context. Um, a, you're going to hear them say, I salute those kids. What they're talking about and referring to is the students or the young, the young people, the youth that had started the protests in Baltimore. It had origi originated in a mall there, the Mondaman Mall. Um, and you're going to hear them say uh, what took place earlier was a sample of our injustices, and if they don't convict those police, it's going to be worse than that. They're talking about the fact that the CVS was on fire and the city was literally burning. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that this tape is not easy to listen to. There's racist language. There's uh, descriptions of police violence. And so it's not easy to listen to, and so I wanted to flag that before we press play. So um, we can play it now. Names, I've been called nigger, thug, all any name you can think of by police. So some, you know, and some of them are white and some of them are black. You know, it's just a, it's not a black and white thing, it's a civilian police thing. That's Lonnie and in the black. black. Aren't from here, and that's Jared. Like I said, I've never grew up in environments like this. They think that we make that I think they think that we're making this stuff up. You know what they also think? You know they think that we're playing the victim. Yeah, oh, like, you know, you sell drugs, what do you expect? That's, you, you deserve it, Come on, man. Oh, well, that's your fault because you live there. Listen, my father was a firefighter. My aunt owns a hair salon. My grandfather worked for the city of Baltimore until he passed away. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we, we didn't need or have to live where we live at in this city. We chose to live here because we love this city, we love our neighborhood, and we have hope that things will change and things will get better. You know exactly. what I'm saying? That's why I told her, like, them doing what they did, those kids being brave enough to demonstrate I what we them, I salute man. them, too, I salute because them, they gave man. us a platform for us to speak the way we're yes, speaking they now. they did. You know, without they, them they, doing what they did, they we would still be being ignored. You know what I'm saying? We would still be being ignored. They don't put brothers like this in front of the camera. They're not going to put him on they CNN. They're they not going to put me on, they you know, not. on Fox they, 45. They're going to run down on the dude. With, with the, the glasses on and the mask on his face, you they know want to interview them. They you know what I mean? Them. They don't want to interview intelligent. They, they don't. They don't understand that there are intelligent black men that come from together. We've been crying about all this same stuff for the last 30, 40 years, and they've been boiling and boiling and boiling and boiling. And sooner or later, something is going to boil over. Pretty much, it's going to boil over. And I don't later. mean to speak negatively, but that was 
what took place earlier was a sample of our injustice. You know, the fact that they, you know, we, we weren't sure if they would even be, you know, tried or charged. Right. If, do, if they don't convict those police, oh my. God. It, they gonna, think Monday was bad. It's gonna be worse than this. It's gonna be bad, unfortunately. And unfortunately, we're not promoting negativity right, or anything not like that. Negativity we're just speaking on the anything. understanding of the environment that we that's, come that's from. That's all. Like it, it hurt me to this. It, like I cried watching I did Bill O'Reilly on TV talking about stuff that he don't know nothing, nothing about. about. He ain't never been harassed by the police. He ain't never been searched for no apparent reason, they, having them reach all in your private on. areas they, and everything. Come on, man. No the police will grab you, make you pull your pants down in front of people. Yes. You know what they tell you? Lift your sack up. So they can search Lift under that for your drugs sack. or anything like that. That's, that is up. a violation of your human rights right there. They, they not supposed to be able to do that. But they do do it because they know that they can, and nothing will happen. And, and that goes to nothing answer a question happen. that you asked me earlier. You said, how many Freddie Grays do I feel exist in the city of Baltimore? Man, He's Freddie Gray. I'm Freddie of, Gray. We all Freddie Gray. We just, we just, they just ain't kill us. So that's how that conversation went. And basically, uh, what happened next was a, a mistake that I made that I... Uh, it haunts me to this day, but as soon as that interview was over, I turned off my Marantz, started to pack it up to go in the subway. And within seconds, uh, Lonnie Moore in the black t-shirt had left. It was just Jared and I. And within seconds, it was now 10 p.m., cur police curfews in effect, and the intersection that we were in just is completely stormed by police officers telling us we had to leave. So I try to go in the subway, which the entrance is right behind us there. There's a police officer saying you can't go in that way. So we try to leave another way. There's again yet another police officer saying you can't go in this way. So we were essentially, that we tried a third way and everywhere we turned there were police officers telling us to leave but not letting us leave from where we were trying to leave. Things escalated very quickly and before I knew it there was a police officer chasing uh, myself and Jared, waving his police baton calling Jared every name in the book and I basically just ran. I ran and I could hear Jared turn around and tell the police officer, ain't I a man too? Ain't I a man too? And we ran until we were out of, you know, out of the area and I just remember it ended with Jared sitting on the sidewalk and crying saying we're tired. And so this is the most vivid kind of memory I have of my time in Baltimore and so I came back to Toronto 36 hours later, such a whirlwind. And I wanted to air this piece to set up the documentary that I was going to tell about Tyrone West in the lead up to creating that doc. Um, and so I cut that tape, that piece of tape that you just heard, and I filed it. And then I was told by my executive producer that we're not going to run it. And um, I didn't understand why, so I went into her office to talk to her. And the very first question that she asked me was, how can you verify that these men gave you their real names? And so this was a question that kind of stopped me in my tracks. I'd never been asked about how I'd verified someone's name before. I'd been to other uh, protests and rallies and festivals and you, you, know, you take down people's names, but no one had ever asked me to prove that someone's name was right. And more than that, in the moment, even though I couldn't name it you know, in that specific moment, it just it felt like an immediate casting of doubt. Um, we didn't even, she was questioning their names, let alone their experiences. But then I offered her, I have, I know why they gave me their real names. And I was, I told her the story of Jared Jones correcting the, the spelling of how I'd written his name. And that if this was someone who was lying about his name, he wouldn't go to lengths to tell me to, to spell it the right way. She seemed unswayed. The next question was, did you verify their accounts with the police? Which in and of itself is a question that, you know, I, I don't, can't imagine any police department getting a call from a journalist saying, hello, did you ask these men to pull their pants down and search in their genital areas for drugs? I can't imagine that they would have confirmed it, but as a journalist and in the process of how we do the work that we do, I had called the police department in Baltimore. I'd also called the police union. They had not responded to my requests by phone, by email. And so I told her that. And the conversation ended with her essentially reminding me about the important principles of verification, accuracy, and transparency. And this piece was not going to run. So I came back to my desk, sat down. Uh, an astute colleague of mine noticed my face, older white male colleague, and he asked me what was going on. I told him 
you know, this piece isn't going to run and I don't understand why. And he went into the executive producer's office, spoke to her, and came out. I still don't know what they spoke about in that room, but when he came out, he said, the piece is going to run. And if not for his intervention, this, this would have never run. That's just one example that I wrote about in The Walrus. The second one was uh, uh, around the town halls that we did on race and racism. This was the one that we did in Vancouver on racism in healthcare. One of the panels uh, was a panel of Indigenous nurses talking about the kind of treatment that they see that Indigenous people um, uh, go through in the healthcare system. And um, she was talking about the differences between how Indigenous people are treated and how white people are treated. And so um, this was part of our conversation. Here's about a minute and a half that we can play now. We could have a, a non-Indigenous person that um, came in intoxicated and, uh, you know, that person can be quite lively and acting out and causing some problems. What I see happen with them is they're given food, um, told to settle down, and then they get a cab ride to um, one of the halfway houses or one of the, um, like the night places that we have that open up, some of the churches open up spaces at night. With Indigenous people, um, I see the RCMP called. I see the RCMP handcuff those people. I see them handcuff their ankles to their wrists so they can't walk. They can't run away, so they won't be a problem. I see, um, I see those people get taken away in, in the in the police cars, and um, I've I've often tried to intervene and explain that my patient is a residential school survivor. Please don't tie them up. Please don't do that to them. I will take them out. I will put them in your car, I'll put their seatbelt on, but no. I'm told by the RCMP that they are doing that for their own protection. So this segment, uh, obviously we put in a call to the RCMP to ask about this practice, to say, to check what Diane Lindgren had just told us and include them in the coverage. They wrote back, sent us a statement, said that we bi practice bias-free policing, we don't do this. And based on that statement, um, the executive producer on that series did not want to run not just this clip but the whole segment and I asked why and he said well the police said it doesn't doesn't happen and so myself and a co-producer fought to keep this whole segment that we had spent weeks putting together um, and we fought to keep this this segment from being uh, cancelled because the police said this doesn't happen and I just thought, this is such basic journalism 101. Why are we even talking about this? And so we salvaged it. Um, but it was a very glaring example of how easily police narratives can effectively disappear, silence, negate, and completely erase Indigenous people, and I would say in Black people and other racialized people's experiences, but specifically Indigenous people in this case. That was another case that I wrote about in my Walrus article. And my very last one, Again, this is just a selection of stories that happened over 10 years, but this one was unique in the sense that this was a story that I had produced in 2017, and the, what makes this one stand out is this is the only story in my 10 years at CBC that did not see the light of day. It did not get rescued, it did not get, you know, it just did not go to air. Um, basically, this was a story, um, it was uh, 2017, there were protests happening in Jerusalem, and because there had been two Israelis that had been stabbed to death. And as a result, the Israeli military and Israeli police had erected more checkpoints, more barriers, more security um, metal detectors for people who were going to Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque to pass through these metal detectors. In a show of civil disobedience, uh, Palestinian Muslims refused to go through those metal detectors and instead chose to pray outside of the compound, refusing to kind of be exposed to even more uh, militarization. So there was a, a journalist named Ahmed Shahab Din, Palestinian, Kuwaiti, American, Emmy-nominated journalist who had been there reporting on it. Um, I was working on another show at the time, not my home show, a weekly show. I pitched a story on a Monday and I was told, we want this story, we want it to be our lead, please get this for us, we think he'll be great. 
And what I wanted to talk to him about was not just the story, I wanted to talk about his experience in reporting it because as you see from this tweet, he was stopped, frisked and pushed around while doing his reporting. And so I wanted to talk about what it's like to cover the story when you are yourself subjected to this kind of treatment. Um, I felt the pressure all week to get this interview, finally landed it, he confirmed he would do it with us uh, late Thursday, we recorded it Friday morning. Before recording it, I'd had all the questions ready, we framed it with a senior producer and the host. Everyone knew what we were going to talk about, the questions. Um, it went long, it went about 20 minutes, I ended up uh, cutting it down to about seven, went for a little celebratory coffee walk, came back to my desk and was told, we're not running this story, we don't have time to tell you why. Um, and I saw a senior manager leave the area that we were in and I was wondering why she was there and it was because they had just killed the story without even telling me that they were going to. I was not part of this editorial decision. I didn't even know there was a problem. The story did not run and even a week later I, I spent a whole week trying to understand what had happened here and I never got a straight answer. So all of this went into my uh, my walrus piece and it was very hard to, writing it was very hard, I, I wanted to give up, I want, frequently wanted to give up over four months. But the scariest part was the fact check. Um, so here's my a snippet of my annotated uh, draft for Nicole, Nicole Schmidt, my fact checker who took this on. Um, writing this was hard as hell, annotating it was hard as hell, but then here comes the moment where Nicole is going to call my colleagues and ask about these stories and I was terrified. I was terrified about the ramifications, I was terrified about what that would mean for me, and I felt like this was going to be almost like a, um, a, a trial of sorts, like that we're going to finally talk about and litigate what actually happened, not litigate, I know it's not litigation, <laughs> but um, it, it was very scary um, for me and very, oh gosh, the anxiety that I had throughout this whole process, it's a miracle this piece ever got out. But here's what Nicole came back with. On the matter of Baltimore, you'll see in the blue, the executive producer um, said that she regularly asked reporters for verifications of sources, uh, verification of sources' names and their accounts, to which I was saying, this is the first time I remember her asking it of me. She also didn't recall the, po the part of um, questioning uh, Jared Jones' spelling or me telling her that his spelling, uh, that he corrected it, and she didn't remember. But it was, I, it was so validating in a way to just get a response about what had happened here. On the matter of uh, the Jerusalem interview that didn't run, the senior producer and director told Nicole uh, that they felt the interview was too opinionated. Which for me is confusing because I thought, well, we all knew what his opinion was going to be. We spent a week chasing him. You told me you wanted him to be the lead. So at what point do we ask someone to be part of a show and then say, no, but we don't like their opinion? But anyway, validating, I got some kind of response. It took everything in me not to be like, here's six more paragraphs <laughs> about why this doesn't, but that was, that was not the point. And most interestingly to me, the very, the, the, in, in, in the case of the indigenous nurses, um, one that the executive producer who didn't want to run it, he could not be reached for confirmation, which I thought very interesting. This is someone who was concerned about um, journalistic accuracy and not wanting to run something that may be false um, or that the police said didn't happen but didn't want to participate in the journal journalistically rigorous process of a fact check. Um, anyway, um, I was terrified when this piece was about to go live. I will never forget it. It was August 21st at 9.58 a.m. <laughs> that it was posted online and I was like, well, there goes the end of my journalism career. It's coming out and no one's ever going to want to work with me again. And I sat there and I waited for my career to implode. Um, and so one of the first signs that I thought things are going to be okay was um, Jody Wilson-Raybould, first, well, former, first former, for <laughs> she was at one point the first Indigenous Justice Minister and Attorney General. She had served in Justin Trudeau's cabinet. By this point she was no longer a part of that cabinet, having gone through her own issues with the government and a very high profile exit. But she tweeted this and said it was worth a read and said thank you. And she connected with this line that she quoted. Um, and then it was just an avalanche of uh, tweets, DMs, texts. I just was completely overwhelmed with, with responses to the article that said 
similar things that happened to them. I heard a lot from Maori journalists in New Zealand and Australia, indigenous journalists there. I basically heard from people across Canada, the US, uh, Wales, Sweden, the UK. And, um, and I heard from people outside of journalism too, um, academia, law, medicine, urban planning, believe it or not. And I got this email from a woman in Sweden. And basically, I'll just highlight this one part. Um, she said she worked in public radio, she was a black woman, and she said, I felt like I was reading extracts from my own career, only with slightly different scenarios. The feeling of having to erase yourself from a story completely and thereby also erase your race because objectivity in the mainstream media's view equals whiteness. The sudden demand for facts and statistics that don't exist when it comes to reporting about racism in the public sector. The list, as you know, goes on. It was at the same time sad, slightly creepy, but also inspiring to read about your situation. Um, sad for obvious reasons, but inspiring because we are now starting to have these conversations. And I thought, wow, you know, people take issue sometimes. Some people take issue with the word systemic racism, but how is a black woman in Sweden telling me you, I felt like I was reading about my own life? Um, our good friend Tom Rosensteel weighed back in on objectivity for the first time. Um, he was obviously part of this conference. He spoke yesterday. And what I loved about him wading back in, he was responding to an article that Wesley Lowry had written in the New York Times. Uh, it was an op-ed called A Reckoning Over Objectivity Led by Black Journalists. And um, in speaking to Tom uh, uh, on when we met on Wednesday, he told me that he basically was almost, uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but people were saying, you got to respond, you got to respond, like objectivity is back in the, in the, in the sphere. You know, Wes Lowry's just written this piece about objectivity, he, he refers to you. So, so Tom Rosensteel weighed back in and basically said that, you know, objectivity in journalism was never supposed to be about you being objective as a person. It was supposed to be a method and a discipline of verification. And I just remember feeling very heartened by this reminder of what objectivity was supposed to mean and what it wasn't supposed to mean. Um, some very cool things happened after this article came out, some highlights, a national magazine award for um, the piece edited by Samia, fact-checked by Nicole. This is our award <clears throat> and it was a first, I mean it was the first article I'd ever written so this was very affirming. Got to go to Harvard last year to be a Neiman Fellow and I got to meet um, the Beyonce of objectivity in journalism, or non-objectivity, but Nicole Hannah-Jones, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. I've met her a couple of times. This was our first meeting at a small intimate dinner with fellow Neiman fellow Felice Leon. Um, and then I got to meet the other Beyonce of objectivity in journalism, <laughs> Tom. Uh, I got to meet him at the conference. Um, I, like a total journalism nerd, brought my elements of journalism <laughs> book, got him to sign it, and he wrote this really nice note, a fellow missionary in the journey towards telling true stories. Tom, if you're watching, I know you, you asked for the link. It was so lovely to meet you, and I told him it was a very full circle moment for this person who barely made it into J school, who failed her first assignment, who you know, left uh, her organization uh, under these circumstances to get to be in conversation with and in the room with someone like Tom Rosensteel and to be part of this evolving conversation. Um, was a very full circle moment for me. But beyond that, what the fact check in this article did for me was much bigger than Harvard or an award, but it did a number of things. For me, it gave me the ability to stop doubting, questioning, and second guessing my own experiences. It got me an accountability and transparency that I never got myself. And just the very fact of fact checking was, you know, it said, these facts matter. We want to get it right. This fact was noteworthy. We're reporting this. What can you add to it? And I was very heartened by the respect and the validation of that process, the commitment to getting an accurate report of what had happened and getting it on the record in this way, in this independent, fact-checked, very solid journalistic institution. Beyond that, it took this conversation and made it bigger than me. It elevated it from the micro to the macro, it went, not from, it went from not just this happened to me, but this happens in many outlets in Canada and around the world. The fact check, the independence, and the reputation of the walrus took this to new heights I could never have reached with a 500 long tweet thread. So when in doubt, don't tweet, write for the walrus. 
And because of this, and I think this is the thing that gives me a little bit of hope, um, is that this article, and many of you in this room have told you have told me that you've you've read my article in classes here at Carleton. Um, I've spoken to some of your classes. And I think the thing that's most exciting to me is that it's become a mainstay of journalism syllabi across Canada and the US, that it's influencing the way that journalism is taught. Um, when I was in J school, we were not talking about objectivity. It was just like, be objective, end of story. I, I can't remember a single conversation about objectivity, but it's been really lovely. Um, on the left there, I actually got to go to speak to Professor Susanna Siegel's class at Harvard when I was there in person last year. I went and spoke to her, Truth Lies in the Press, and I actually spoke to her class again remotely on Monday. And on the right, I got to go back to TMU, where I barely almost got into journalism school and did my first ever in-person lecture in Canada in September. And I'm just so heartened by the fact that um, these conversations are happening in J school. I love that we're talking about this. I love that students are um, writing their reports on objectivity and talking to me. And honestly, none of this would have been possible if not for the diligence of my fact checker, Nicole Schmidt, the, <laughs> the um, very deft hand of my editor, Samia Madwar, for getting me across the finish line. I almost gave up on this so many times, but it felt so good to be working with people on this story, not against. I was very worried that this would become a whole other level of did this really happen? And so um, it's just been, I, I could have never imagined that this would happen when I wrote my chaotic, rambly first pitch to the walrus. Um, in preparing to speak to you today, I'll leave you with this one last thing. I mean, Nicole, finally, I'd never spoken to Nicole before, apart from just doing the fact check, but we got on a Zoom a couple of weeks ago and I asked her, what was it like to fact check this? Um, I felt like an ex-wife who was calling my divorce lawyer saying like, what did the ex-husband say when I wasn't in the room? <laughs> but she came back with something very surprising actually. And she said that the thing she heard the most from people that she spoke to was, I didn't think about it like that. Or I didn't see it that way. And I thought, of course, of course people see things differently. Of course people think about things differently. And I thought about how easy it is for all of us to not see things the same way, for things to be seen differently. And as you've seen just in these three short examples, how that influences what stories are told, if they're even told at all. Um, and it made me think about, and this conference and being here today has made me think about how do we have conversations like this? I didn't think about it like that. I didn't see it that way in a non-punitive way where you're not just passed up for a job that you think you can do. You're not just, your story's not killed without any discussion. And I, I really uh, feel frustrated and very sad about the fact that in journalism, we're not able to have these conversations in ways that are not punitive, that don't stunt people's careers, that don't have them just turn their back on the industry completely. And I thought, what an act of grace, what an act of hopefulness to actually be in conversation. Nicole basically outsourced a conversation that I'd been wanting to have for so long about why these things happened. And what I love about this conference, and I was joking around to Ali and Viv about this yesterday, that I, what I've loved about this conference is that we're taking these age-old ways of doing journalism, um, things from a panel yesterday that Simon Lucen um, moderated about uh, informed consent. And we asked, you know, the question raised about, do you show someone a draft of your article if you've written it about them? And there was like this quiet, like, oh my gosh, that's scandalous. Mm -hmm. But Simon was like, no, let's talk about it. Why did that originate? Should we still do it? Are there instances where we shouldn't? And it felt like we were having all these conversations that we don't get to have. We're all deadline driven. Everyone's afraid of being cast out or seen as not a journalist. And I really, this, I didn't think about it like that and I didn't see it that way, really stood out to me as we really need to do better about having conversations when we don't see things the same way. And to ask why, and to ask about the ramifications about how it shows up in our work. So I honestly could never have dreamed that when I, all these things happened, I remember almost quitting my job the day that Jerusalem interview didn't run. I was so incensed about the lack of transparency and all the things that we talk about. I was so mad that I almost quit on the spot, but I stuck it out and I found the right time and the right space to say what I needed to say. And I could have never dreamed that I would be here at a conference on journalism 
asking these questions about our craft with people who care so deeply about it. So this this um, this article, uh, you know, it took me from from my job at CBC to to Harvard to syllabi across the country to standing here with you today, and none of it wouldn't have been none of it would have been possible without the diligence of my fact checker Nicole Schmidt and the work and the institution and the, the journalism that the walrus does. So thank you, Ali and Viv, thank you for having me here today and for um, encouraging us to think about our profession and how to make it better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like Ali and Viv, I'm also tearing up on the inside. Um, I actually had a question based on something that happened to me when I was in my first year of journalism. I'm now in my fourth year. Um, I remember pitching a section for international students in news, so for us to cover news that mattered to international students, because a lot of what we covered was very much just domestic students. And mm -hmm. the Charlatan Carlton's newspaper at the time the editor-in-chief told me that it wasn't relevant to the Carlton mm. audience, even though about 3,000 students are international students. And maybe it's on me that I didn't pursue it any further or ask mm. for more reasons. I just felt so defeated. And I was wondering, how would you have navigated that situation? Mm. It's a great question. And I feel like the not relevant, it reminds me of the like missing audience connection piece that I would get. So. I, again, I, I go back to the, the, the question that we ask, or that I try to ask a lot, is like, why? So, and and I, I don't mean this to be a completely adversarial conversation, but I think why is your strongest, your strongest tool? Why is it not relevant? And, and, and I don't want to say forcing, but encouraging them to think about what they mean by relevance, and relevance to whom? This was for a specific audience that you had identified. And I, you came up with a number, you gave me a number. I would have said, well, it's relevant to 3,000 students. And, and, I, and I would say, I know Day and I were just talking about, you were just telling me about a huge growing international student population. This is a story that's going to resonate not just here, but across. So I always ask why. Um, sometimes because it'll make the pitch better and you can come back with that information. Maybe he would have said or she would have said, um, if you come back with stats about how many students, how many international students there are, and you can make the case for why this is going to be, maybe it would have gone forward. But I like asking why because it can make a pitch stronger um, and maybe you get to do it. And if not, you're forcing people to, even if they don't see it in the moment, to think through their own biases, their own reasons, and their own ways of discounting things. And maybe your questions will enable them to see it differently. And that's always the goal with asking why for me. Yeah. Pitch it again. <laughs> Tell them I said you should do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, Pasin. Thank you so much uh, for your address. Um, one of the things that happens is that a lot of us who write about these issues are often made to feel like we're competing against each other mm -hmm. uh, because there's limited resources, limited spots available. Um, but what are the what are the ways in which you know a rising tide could lift all boats? Uh, because there are certain conversations where, uh, I know you said that keep asking why, keep fighting, but it can get exhausting. Mm -hmm. So we can take turns mm -hmm. in asking why these conversations aren't bigger conversations in newsrooms. Uh, how have you seen that happen with representation perhaps growing in newsrooms, do you think? Um, how, how can we fight this urge to think that we are all, so that racialized and BIPOC journalists are against each other? Uh, mm. or pitted against each other? How do we fight this urge? How do we rethink the ways mm. in which we interact with each other in newsrooms? Yeah, it's a great question. And I have to say, when I started in TV, I felt that very acutely. I, I used to be called by another producer's name who did not look anything like me, but we were the only two in that newsroom. And um, anyway, there was a very unhealthy uh, sense of competition that I was thrust into because there were so few of us. And 
it was so easy for me to be mad at this person. We, it was not an easy situation when I first started. But then I remembered that this, this, this sense of competition, this is the scarcity mindset, is a result of um, just how little space we all have. It feels like it has to be just one of us, and I think that's such a scarce way of thinking about it. And thank goodness when I moved into radio, the environment really changed. But I think it's so important to. I've, I've said it before, but if I didn't have friends, uh, uh, allies, people who I could speak to about this, where we could do this work together, you cannot do it alone. I would have burnt out long ago. But I think, like, find your people. There's going to be people who see this as competition. There will always be those people. But if we're all competing for the same thing, which is just the chance to tell the stories that we want to tell and to have the latitude and the space to do that. And it's, you know, I think it's also very flattening to be like, oh, because we're racialized, we're going to get together and get along all the time. And that's not necessarily true. So find the people who are on the same mission as you. And I would say, you know, in the case of my story in Baltimore, if not for the intervention of an older white male colleague, that story wouldn't have run. So, you know, allyship, I think people love to throw that word around, but it's a verb. And it's, a, it's something that you do. And so find the people who are on that same mission. And when you sense the competitive pitting against each other, um, like I, I understand it, but I realize that's not my fight. I'm not here to outcompete you. I'm, we're actually running the same race. Um, so I try to divest myself of that weird competitive thing because it's there. I'm not dismissing it, but I try to stay focused on the bigger, the bigger work and, um, and finding people who are doing that work with me and not in a sense of competition. But it's hard. I feel you. I wanted to say one thing that I uh, forgot to say, which is that um, the minute I knew the story was going to be freaking airtight is when a friend of mine, um, I'll tell this story very briefly, I wrote about it in The Walrus, but I had friends over June 2020, month into uh, after George Floyd's murder, we're in the pandemic, everyone's angry, enraged, we'd all been siloed and not seen each other, and so I invited a group of friends of mine, they were all black women, journalists, we sat on my back patio and we raged about what was happening, we we just shared about all the things that we were seeing and feeling and this reckoning and in this very angry time. And um, by the end of the day, you know, they stayed till night. I brought out candles. We had tea. We were laughing by the end and dreaming of creating our own thing. But it was a very, very hot day in June when this happened, unusually hot. And I wrote that in my Walrus article. <laughs> and one of my friends who was on the patio with me that day called me and she said, girl, this fact check is serious. Because <laughs> Nicole asked me, what were you wearing? <laughs> to prove that it was in fact a hot day and I was like yes I'm gonna be bulletproof so thank you for your diligence Nicole you made this bulletproof <laughs> thank you all so much oh sir yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to say that was amazing, so thank you so much for that. And so my question is, in the last few days we've talked a lot about the importance of fact-checking, but also like its difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, as an early career journalist and a student, there's often the extra barrier of having little to no resources or flexibility or time. Um, how can I balance my desire as a racialized person to report on these incredibly important stories with that reality? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I would say, like, I only got the resource of fact-checking through the walrus. I'd never had that before. But what I did have and what I brought to the walrus was, like, and this was in my fact-checking package to Nicole, like, receipts on receipts on receipts. All the emails, I would send myself notes, and this was maybe, maybe I'm speaking it specifically to when you're writing about journalism. Um, but I kept very uh, detailed records of everything that had happened, conversations that had happened, emails that were exchanged, raw interviews that never saw the light of day. I kept my own kind of record of things so that when it came time to talk about it, I could, I could find it and, and dig it up. So I know maybe your question's a bit different and mine was a very specific thing, but I would just say like um, do as much as you can to resource your own r research. Like, um, do go the extra mile and have like information and I know there's misinformation and disinformation but if you have facts and research and material to support what it is that you want to write about um, you can do a lot of that on your own obviously the fact check makes it bulletproof but try to um, 
try to keep find a way to kind of have your own records of the things that you want to write about the things that you care about so that when you are writing about it you have a dearth of material and you're not starting from zero and it's a long process yeah I would say it's a great question okay thank you all again thank you so much I mean, hard to like follow. <laughs> I'm still holding back tears a little bit. Um, thank you all again so much for, for coming to the conference, to all the panelists, the moderators, all the speakers, the keynotes, Nagan, uh, Tom, Pacent, uh, for incredible talks, incredible discussions. We feel so grateful, so yeah. privileged to have been able to work with all of you uh, over the past year and a half and to speak with you. And we've learned so much from all of you. Um, I don't cry, so I'm, gonna, I'm just, I just, uh, yeah. yeah. And thank you to everyone in the audience, too, yeah. and everyone online. Um, and who, uh, also, of course, our funders, the Missioner Foundation, uh, mm -hmm. Social Sciences Humanities Council, Research, uh, Research Council of Canada. <laughs> I still didn't get it. <laughs> um, and also Carleton. And Carleton. And the Walrus, of course. Yeah. Um, there are so many names, so many people. I feel like I'm giving an Oscar speech <laughs> right now. <laughs> Um, but yes, thank you. And yes. please stick around. Uh, we'll have a, a little student uh, town hall for if students want to stick around or come in if you're watching uh, somewhere else in the school and want to come and talk to us. Um, I, I think some of us will stick around if, if you're... And um, the videos from this conference and all the content and also the fact-checking guide are all on our website, which is yes. the tijproject.ca. So we'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs>